John Hooks Newsmaker starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker. Crisis is a word we throw around a lot on the news, but what we're going to explore tonight really is a crisis. The national debt, which is now over $34 trillion. That is $103,000 for every man, woman, and child in the U.S. And if we don't get a handle on this, and quickly, we're going to be facing some very unpleasant choices going forward. From 1950 to 2008, the national debt was 40% of gross domestic product, GDP. That's all the goods and services that we produce. The debt is now 99% of our economy. We are in what many economists describe as a debt death spiral. The question is, is there a way out? Brian Riedel is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He's an expert on the budget and the national debt. Brian, thank you for being here. Glad to be here, John. Okay, we hit a very um, ugly mark just yesterday. The U.S. is now borrowing $100,000 a second. Borrowing. This is insane. The, the, the numbers are too big to even think about. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, the debt the, the debt right now exceeds two hundred thousand dollars per household, about a hundred more than a hundred thousand dollars per individual. Government spending is now about fifty thousand dollars per household in America. Think what you could do if you could keep that money instead of the government. Really, the danger with deficits is we talk about billions and trillions and huge numbers, but some numbers people can relate to is that we're getting to the point where within a couple decades, most of the taxes you pay will just go to interest on the debt, not social security benefits, Medicare benefits, veterans, highways, troops. You're gonna be paying most of your taxes for interest on the debt. And that's a point too where middle-class taxes could eventually double. Oh my God. Okay, let's put it in terms of a family. I'm gonna put up a graphic here. Um, and correct me if any of this doesn't look correct. Median family income in the U.S. is 74000 If a family spent money like the federal government, it would spend 103000 per year, which means it would have put 28478 on the credit card. This is last year, mm -hmm. despite already being half a million in debt. This is what we're doing on the national level. Absolutely. Those numbers, those numbers look accurate, and it's completely unsustainable. There, there's a certain view that deficits don't matter because we haven't felt the pain yet. The problem with financial crises and fiscal crises is that by the time you feel the pain, it's too late. And the problem right now, we're borrowing so much money that the financial markets have already shown they're not sure they can handle it. Uh, interest rates have been rising already over the last couple of years. We're going to need to borrow $150 trillion over the next three decades just to keep the government we have on autopilot, $150 trillion. It's not clear where we're going to borrow that $150 trillion from, and that means such dangerous options as the printing press, inflation, uh, huge, huge uh, interest rate hikes, um, and, and an economic crisis. And don't take my word for it. The economists at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School did an analysis last October and found they could not even model out an existing economy under the long-term debt projections. Their models broke down. That's the, how unsustainable this is. Brian, is this potentially an end game for the United States as we know it? Is it something that literally threatens our sovereignty? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the problem is it, part of the issue is who we borrow the money from. If we're borrowing a lot of money from China, Japan, other countries, you somewhat become dependent on their generosity and you become on the hook. You, you, you basically gamble some of your own uh, national sovereignty. But even if you don't, a country that gets this deep into debt ultimately hamstrings itself because it has to put all of its money into paying the interest on it. There isn't enough money left over for Social Security benefits, Medicare benefits, national security gets shortchanged. And when you 
require the financial markets to lend you this much money, you become totally dependent on the financial markets. And as soon as the financial markets cry uncle and say, we can't lend the money anymore, then the federal government becomes functionally insolvent. Could that actually happen? Could we actually yeah. go? I mean, we could we could end up uh, in chapter, what would it be? Chapter nine or chapter 11? I don't know. What would you call it? Yeah, and the danger is there's no one to bail us out. The, the advantage we have compared to other countries is that we can print our own money. Although that's not really an advantage because that just creates a lot of inflation. The disadvantage we have compared to other countries is there's no one who can bail out the US. When Greece goes under with a debt crisis, the rest of the world economy can bail out Greece. Right. If America needs to borrow $150 trillion, the rest of the world economy is not big enough to bail us out. So what ultimately happens in a debt crisis like that is you, you have to pay your bills. You can't borrow anymore. So the options are either to massively raise taxes, dramatically cut spending, or run the printing press, which is just hyperinflation. Yeah, and nobody can loan it to us because this isn't happening only in the U.S. Across the globe, global debt is over $300 trillion. It was $100 trillion 10 years ago. There's nobody left. You could pool all the money out there, and they probably couldn't cover us. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's already been articles in the Wall Street Journal about the financial markets concerned that they can't supply enough savings to lend us all of this money. Again, you mentioned the national debt now exceeds $30 trillion. We're going to have to borrow, as I mentioned, $150 trillion more over the next three decades just to pay for the existing programs. That's not even counting any new government expansions we have to pay for. The question is, who is going to lend the United States government $150 trillion over 30 years? And if it comes from the U.S., that's going to come out of our savings in the country. That's going to come out of investment. And it's going to mean less money for home loans, car loans, student loans, business loans. It's going to mean higher interest rates. Debt trends like we have now don't end well. Okay, Brian, this, this really would qualify as a crisis, yet I don't see any urgency, at least not on the surface, from the politicians to get serious about this issue. It seems like they won't get serious until it's critical mass, and by then it might be too late. And you've written extensively about this, and, and by the way, this is not political. You lay the blame at the step of both parties. Yeah, you, you don't build a $30 trillion debt with just one party. Both sides have, have done this. The Democrats have spent and spent and spent and refused entitlement reforms. Republicans promised big spending cuts and balanced budgets. And then when they get elected, they cut taxes and also increase spending drastically. You know, even under President Trump, he added $7.8 trillion in new uh, debt financed legislation in just four years. So there's a lot of blame to go around. But really, the blame ultimately comes to the voters, because we are the ones who can't accept the truth on these issues. We're the ones who keep rewarding politicians who refuse to talk about this. And the, the, the reason politicians don't want to talk about it is the answers and the solutions are really painful. For instance, the main driver of our deficits is that Social Security and Medicare face a $124 trillion shortfall over the next 30 years. You know, there's a myth that these programs pay for themselves. They no. don't. They're no. in debt, $124 trillion. Politicians don't want to talk about that. No, it's, it's, it will get you unelected. Let's put up chart number two, because there's a lot of talk about where does the money go in the federal mm -hmm. system? 81% of it goes to... Medicare, Medicaid, that would be under health care, Social Security, and interest on the debt. Okay, so when we talk about, well, let's get rid of fraud, waste, and abuse, mm -hmm. that doesn't even scratch the surface. Unless you dig into these big programs, you can't get anywhere, correct? Yeah, the, the problem I have, and I, 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 I get, I've given speeches all over the country on this. I engage people on Twitter all day long. The problem is people have their one cool trick that they think is going to eliminate the deficit. If you just get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse, <laughs> or defund Ukraine, 
or cut defense right. or tax the rich, it'll will solve the problem. Mathematically, you can do all of that. It won't come close to paying for the Social Security and Medicare liabilities. So our choice is fix Social Security and Medicare or double middle class taxes. Those are your choices. Okay. There is no third option. Th this is what I wanted to get to. Okay. The Democrats say, um, well, how do we put this tactfully? Uh, the Democrats say that, that we need to, you know, we need to have more programs. We need to do more stuff. And we can, we can afford it. Um, and we need to raise taxes to do it. The Republicans say, we don't have a... Uh, we don't have a, a, a money problem, a revenue problem. In other words, money coming into the federal government. Mm -hmm. We've got a spending problem. So we can still raise taxes and limit programs, and we'll be fine. Who's right? Well, they're both wrong. Um, <laughs> st starting, with, starting with the Democrats, the Democrats say we need to raise taxes. But if you look at President Biden's budget, he wants to raise taxes not to deal with the deficit, but just to pay for new spending. That puts us in an even worse position because the deficit's just as big as it was, and now you've already used up a lot of the tax hikes that are out there, which means you have to raise everyone else's taxes more. Republicans say, as long as we restrain spending, we can even cut taxes. The problem is Republicans never get to the next step, which is actually restraining spending. Ah, there you go. Because ultimately, again, this is mostly a Social Security and health care problem, and Republicans are just as scared of touching Social Security and Medicare as the Democrats are. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so the way out, is there, because the timeline on this, some people say we've got about 20 years. I think the timeline is much, much less than that. Like, we're kind of in a four-year window, the way I see it. <laughs> Am I wrong? We have to move now. Every year we delay, the debt gets bigger, interest rates get higher, and also, if we're going to fix Social Security and Medicare, the boomers get older. The boomers are going to be too old to absorb benefits pretty quickly if they're not already. So every year we wait, the cost of reform goes, goes drastically higher. So there is no 10, 20, 30 years we have to wait. Um, if we don't handle just the next couple of years, we are pretty much guaranteeing a fiscal crisis at some point that will be followed probably by a roughly doubling of middle class taxes. Because again, you get to a certain point where the retirees are too old to, to absorb Social Security and Medicare reform. You start to get European sized tax hikes but instead of families getting the benefits like in Europe, it's all going to go to their to their elderly parents. The, the taxpayers aren't going to benefit. Let's look forward for a second. Can you tax your way out of this? It is mathematically impossible to tax our way out of this um, without doubling taxes on the middle class. I mean, people say tax the rich. You could seize every penny of every billionaire in America today every bit of their wealth, it would fund the government one time for nine months. You could tax the rich at 100% rates. It still wouldn't balance the budget. The only way you can close a gap this large would be to roughly double middle-class taxes. You wouldn't have to double them at first, but gradually over about a 10 to 20 year period, you would have to double middle-class taxes. Do you think that's where we're heading? I think we are probably, the longer we wait, we are more likely headed to substantial increases in middle class taxes because ultimately, I don't think the political system can handle Social Security and Medicare reform. Anybody who brings it up is destroyed. I know. And even though as I these do programs think, run deficits, that's the only other option. Yeah, even though I do think that the talk about privatizing, um, it would have done a lot better in a marketplace, a free market than managing it ourselves. It would have, over time, done better. It would have. The transition cost is very large, though, because if you switch to private accounts, you still got to pay for the current seniors who paid in their whole life yes. while you're doing personal accounts. So that was always the challenge, is how to do the transition. 
right now, there's really not a lot of great options on Social Security. We're going to have to raise the eligibility age, and benefits are going to have to be trimmed for upper income and probably middle income retirees at a certain point. Because again, Social Security's shortfall is about $38 trillion over the next uh, 30 years. I've always thought that one of the solutions, I don't know what you think, um, you would let the high income people opt out of Social Security for a break on their uh, capital gains tax. Could they work something like that out? uh, Yeah, I mean, the challenge, of course, is the amount of money you lose in the tax cuts might might hurt you more than the amount you're losing in benefits. And so it's tough to make the math work because anytime you say we're going to give these people a break on their payroll taxes, it becomes even harder in the short term to pay benefits. Long term, you're better off um, because you have fewer people collecting benefits down yes. the road, but in the short term, you have to you have to make the benefits anyway. No. Uh, so it, it's 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 hard. There's no one, easy answer. One more. Um, we're we're running short. This is so interesting. Why why do I think we are heading toward a VAT tax like they have in Europe, a, a value added tax to dig our way out of this? Ultimately, I think that's where we will end up. We're the only country in the OECD without a value-added tax. Uh, the danger, of course, is you have to raise about a 20% VAT in order to make a significant dent in the deficits we have. Now, Ouch. for those, again, a value-added tax is like a national sales tax. And that tax. hurts the poor, You're looking right? at about a 20% rate. That really hurts the poor rather than the rich. It's more regressive. Absolutely. Uh, It hits the poor very hard. It is a regressive tax. That's how Europe funds their big government. They don't fund it by taxing the rich. They have payroll taxes twice as high as ours and value added taxes of about 20%. If we don't get spending under control, you should prepare gradually for this outcome. Uh, do you see anything politically in the in the wind of of folks coming to the realization that we have to deal with this? Not much. Um, In the past year, both President Biden and Republicans have tripped over themselves to take Social Security and Medicare reform off the table. They're both yelling, we're not going to touch it. So it's going to have to come from voters. And one thing that might be getting voters' attention is rising interest rates, because this is really just the beginning of rising interest rates. We're going to need that to get people's attention. There is legislation in Congress to create a fiscal commission that would look for bipartisan solutions to Social Security and Medicare. But the leadership of both the GOP and the White House, uh, President Biden, has opposed the fiscal commission to address these issues. Why? Uh, President Biden said, I will not do a fiscal commission because they might change benefits. And Speaker Johnson said he won't do it because it might raise taxes and because he said he will not entertain anything that would reform Social Security and Medicare as well. So that's bipartisan. Neither side wants to make the tough choices. Yeah, on this. and they may not have a choice in the end because we're going to be for our hands going to be forced. Yeah, the math always wins. You know, if if, if you have to borrow 150 trillion over 30 years and the financial markets won't lend it to you. At a certain point, it doesn't matter what politicians want. They won't have the money to to, to keep the spending promises they've made. Wow. Uh, Brian Riedel, Manhattan Institute, I sure appreciate your time. Really interesting stuff. And we'll have you back. Thanks so much. Okay. Brian Riedel, thank you. When we come back, March Madness fueling all kinds of wagering. Is the office pool a potential workplace problem? An employment attorney joins me next on Newsmaker. Welcome back on Newsmaker. U.S. bettors are expected to wager $2.7 billion on the men and women's Final Four in Glendale this year. Last week on this program, we spoke to a problem gambler who got into a lot of trouble wagering on sports. For many, this is just a recreational thing. The office pool would be a prime example. Harmless fun, right? Troy Foster is a local employment lawyer. He joins us now. Troy, thank you. Appreciate you being on the program. Thank you, John. Okay, I got to read you a headline that caught my attention. I thought, boy, you want to just throw cold water on this whole thing? This is out of USA Today. The headline reads, should I be cautious about betting at work or office pools? Ask HR. I thought, I mean, is there any fun left? 
<laughs> it doesn't seem so. <laughs> That's right. Not anymore. <laughs> so is it a problem at work to get into these office pools? Really? It can be. Uh, it's actually against the law in Arizona to gamble uh, unless it's for a social uh, social gambling is OK. And and these office pools generally fall within that. But it still can be problematic. Does anybody get prosecuted for this? I mean, do you know of anybody who's gotten prosecuted for conducting an office pool? There's one person, and it was a manager that I can think of, that actually was taking 30% uh, off the top. Uh, so a little bit of a different crime. but <laughs> Well, that sounds like a guy, <laughs> Neil Wolf, who works here at Fox 10. He would do that. <laughs> <laughs> Innovative. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Yeah. So you, you are an employment law guy. That's your, that's your specialty. What would be right. your advice for people in the workplace? Are there pitfalls and problems that can arise out of this? There are. So if in the workplace the pool isn't distributed to everyone, so for example, it just so happens that a bunch of the guys are in the pool and it hadn't been distributed to other people, you know, there could be a claim of gender discrimination or other oh discrimination my. if people aren't being treated fairly. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, the, uh, the old master's pool that we used to have at the station would definitely fall into that because it was a bunch of guys who got involved in that. Um, what else? Well, I also think that if the, if the company sponsors it, it can be an issue and raise other concerns. Uh, the only other thing that I always caution employers is with anything else, this can really, really bring productivity down, and that's what we could be talking about. But, you know, there's always got to be something, and the culture and camaraderie that these things bring, I think, far outweighs that. Oh, that's good. That's a good point. Okay, so you're not against this stuff? No, not at all. Okay, so your position is, do you concur with <laughs> USA Today? Check with <laughs> HR? You know what that means. <laughs> HR usually is the no spot, right? Yes. I do think you, sh you should, uh, but I think you also want to work in a place and a culture where HR is facilitating that type of camaraderie and, and people are going to work with each other and have fun with it. Uh, so I would check with HR, but I'd also work in a place where HR is going to say yes a little more often. Okay. So uh, in terms of watching the games, there is no doubt that this stuff is a distraction at work. I've seen it with my own two eyes. I've been guilty of it myself. But you've got people who will watch stuff on their phone in a clandestine way. Um, they'll watch it on their TV. They'll lock and load on their TV. Would it be better just to put it up on a big screen and let everybody kind of take it in? I think embracing it and not ignoring it is the way to go. I mean, we always look at things that companies do to try to avoid uh, these things, but you can't avoid them anymore. There's there's no way to do it. Put it up on the big screen. Have have a party. I mean, have a little office gathering and celebrate the winners of these pools. This this figure is stunning. The loss of productivity from March Madness is 17 billion dollars. Yeah, and, and and I think that it's probably that's probably conservative, uh, but. I think that there are other things that we lose productivity on, too. I don't think those numbers calculate in other holidays or, or things like that. That number is a stunning number, but we're not going to get away from it. Or smoke breaks. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we used to joke around here, if you wanted a little time away from your desk, take up smoking. <laughs> not a good a idea. A lot of time away. <laughs> not a good idea. Okay, any last-minute things as we head into this? Uh, I mean, you know, we're... As, as this airs, we're, we're down to the final two now. So any final kind of warning shots you want to send or whatever, it's yeah. the floor is yours. Yeah, so I think, John, I think these things are not as bad as they're made to be. But I think if the company endorses it, we do need to, I kind of joked about having a party. We do need to make sure that the company doesn't endorse that type of a thing where there is going to be drinking and other things that go, go wrong. Um, and that could be problematic for the company. But again, embracing it and having a little fun or letting the employees have a little fun is really a way where I think you overall increase productivity. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, Troy Foster, uh, employment lawyer with the Foster Law Group. Uh, we won't even get into the treachery of the holiday office party. That's where the real stuff happens. We'll have you back around Christmas. Next time. <laughs> okay, Thanks. that's Thanks, a deal. John. Troy, thank you. Troy Foster. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker.